Hello, Kennewood family and our extended family members who are joining us for our service this Sabbath. What an honor to be able to worship with you today. We are truly thankful that you are making time to be a part of this service. While we are physically apart, it is still such a joy and a privilege to be able to connect in this fashion and offer encouragement to each other. I don't know how your week has been, but I know that we have come here expecting a word. Today we'll hear from our Lord and King through his manservant. And whatever situation or circumstance you are battling at this stage of your life's journey, there is a master with a word, a master who guarantees victory, a master healer who delivers healing to your mental, physical, and spiritual ailments, a master marriage counselor who restores marriages hanging by a thread. I don't know why you tuned in today, but I know that if you are in need of clarity in these times of uncertainty, I know a master who provides direction. And this Sabbath, we'll have uh, Sister Sharon Jovo who will provide the scripture reading, and she will also uh, present our prayers and petitions before the master. And for special music, we will hear from our trio of uh, Pastor Jose, his beautiful wife, and his lovely sister. And the word for today will come from uh, Pastor Jose. And uh, I would like to mention that today we are finishing this series entitled, The Greatest Sermon Ever Preached. And today we are specifically talking about, you cannot serve two masters. So now, I invite you to declutter, clear your physical space, take away whatever can be distracting, clear the mental space as well, and make room for the word. May you be blessed. But more importantly, may you be transformed by the word. Happy Sabbath. We will now have scripture reading, which will be taken from Matthew 6, verse 24. And so it reads, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Here ends the reading of God's word. I will now pray. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for everything that you have done for us, God. Thank you for providing for us in ways we cannot even imagine or fathom, God. I want to ask that you be with our friends and our family all around the world, God, people who might just who we might just be acquaintances with, God. I want to ask that you provide for us and for them. I want to ask that you heal us, whether it's spiritually or physically or mentally, God. I want to ask that you be near to us and hold our hands in this journey of life. I want to ask that you please forgive us of our sins and help us to forgive the people who may have done wrong against us, God. Help us to be loving and caring and kind and everything that you want us to be and you want to see in the world, God. At this time, I want to ask that you please put your hand over the speaker, God, and help it not to be his words, but yours. I want to ask that you bless everything and bless this whole service, and I just want to say thank you once again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I will 
This is Pastor Jose Sanchez coming to you from Kendallwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. Before we begin, I just want to say thank you so much to the Njobo family, to Cece, as well as her mom, Sharon, for being a part of our service today. I also want to thank my wife, Angelica, and my sister, Maria, for joining and also delighting us with that wonderful musical presentation. Today, we are wrapping up our series our series entitled, The Greatest Sermon Ever Preached. And if there is anything that I have been able to grasp from the message found in Matthew 5 to 7, is that Jesus is interested in my happiness as well as yours. In the first sermon of our series, we discovered that every single human being wants to be happy. And that desire is in us to awaken our desire for God as well as for his kingdom. For there is nothing or anyone in this world that can satisfy the thirst and the hunger that is in our hearts for happiness but Jesus Christ. In the second sermon, we were encouraged to rest our faith on God's word and God's word alone. We were assured that when we ask, when we seek, and when we knock, the door will always be open. We will always receive. We will always find. Not always what we want but always as something better because Jesus reminded us in Matthew 7, 10 to 11, that if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask? Today we will be wrapping up with a message 
that is inspired in the words of Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and this is what Scripture says. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come to the end of this journey. And we want to thank you so much for teaching the best sermon ever preached when you were here on earth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because throughout this journey, you have shown us that you are all about humanity's happiness. And today, you are about to reveal to us that you desire to be the master of our lives. Because you, Lord, know that when we allow you in, we will experience true happiness and true peace. Not like the world offers peace, but the kind of peace that comes from having you in our lives as master and king. So as we open your word and go through this message, I pray that it will be you the one speaking to us. And that you will use me just as an instrument to bring this message to your people. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I heard a friend once say the following words. Everybody is a slave to something. Everybody is a slave to something. I believe that it is for that reason that Jesus shared those words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He understood that there are things in this world that desire to control and to master over humans. And one thing that I also know is that Jesus Christ also has that desire. He wants to be my master as well as your master. During my short walk here on this world, 26 years, in my journey, I have decided, I have chosen to make of Jesus the master of my life. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, from my 26 years of experience, that there is nothing better than allowing Jesus to be the master of your life. Some of you may disagree with my experience. But if you do, I believe that the reason, or one of the reasons why you disagree with that statement is because, as Pastor David Asherick once mentioned, he said, can I love the God that I see when I close my eyes? Very good question. If the answer is no, I have the wrong picture of God. Very interesting and profound statement. If humans would only be open to seeking God for themselves as they would for a valuable treasure, they would find out that Jesus Christ is worth more than anything that this world can offer. Now, as I thought about the verse that served as our scripture reading for today, I came to the following realization. That there are people whose life appears to show that Jesus is the master of their lives. But in reality, another master is in control. It is incredible how some people skillfully are able to manage this condition. Scripture puts it simply by saying they have an appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. I once heard a story of a man whom every time he was asked to pray, he always said the following phrase, Lord, 
remove the cobwebs out of my life. Lord, please remove the cobwebs out of my life. And one day, as he was just about to say the same phrase, the pastor interrupted the prayer and he said the following words. He said, Lord, kill that spider. Lord, kill the spider. Instead of asking God to help identify and exterminate that spider, which is a symbol of the source of temptation or the open door to temptation, which pulls us from God to other masters, these individuals who only pray, God, remove the cobwebs out of my life, try to manage that double alliance. The double alliance. There is a well-known Bible character whom, like many of us, also sought to manage his double alliance. And this is something that I love about Scripture. In Scripture, we're able to find stories about real people with real issues, just like you and me. The only perfect experience or scenario that we find in Scripture is that of the life of Jesus. Everybody else had issues just like you and me. And there is a man who is well known to all of us who had this particular issue. These masters took him to the darkest places that a person can think of. But I love the fact that God's grace and mercy reached him where he was at and led him to say the words vanity, vanity, all is vanity. This maybe gave you uh, an idea of who it is that I'm about to speak about. This person, this well-known king, is King Solomon. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 3, we read that at the beginning of his reign, this king, Solomon, showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instruction given to him by his father David. One day, as King Solomon was offering sacrifices to his Lord, God appeared to him and asked him a question. And the question was, ask, what shall I give you? In other words, God is saying to him, Solomon, what is it that you desire? I will give it to you. And Solomon, who had such a close connection with Jesus, and he was so new to this position, Solomon chooses to ask for an understanding heart to judge the people and a heart that is able to discern between good and evil. This can be found in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord was his master. The Lord was his delight. The Lord was his everything. But as time progressed, Solomon began to willingly pursue things that God had warned the Israelites about. He left a door open, even though he knew what God expected of him, because that is part of wisdom. He forgot the mathematical equation, quote-unquote, about wisdom, which says that knowing plus having spiritual discernment, having that connection and allowing God to be the one that reveals to us what to do, when we have those two things together, then when we make a decision, we are making a wise decision. But though he knew, he lacked the discernment. Therefore, some of the choices that he made were definitely not wise. Solomon's violations were directly related to three divine commands. Three divine commands that Solomon knew by heart, but he violated. And I want to show you this morning what these violations were. So let's go to our Bibles, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 3 and four. 
And this is what scripture says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Verse 4, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Remember that chapter 7 is God's desire for his chosen people. Israelite was a very special group of people. And God is saying to them to not join their lives with people that were not part of their people. In chapter 17, verse 17, the first part of that verse, we read that God also said to them, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. And this chapter right here, 17, are principles for the governing kings. Once again, neither shall he, the king, multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. God warned about joining their lives in marriages, in marriage with pagans. Pagans meaning people who followed after other gods, who held beliefs that contrasted from theirs, and whose life direction was opposite to God's desired direction for his people. God had given them a warning, thinking about their own well-being. Why? Because as we've been able to see throughout this series, God is all about humanity's happiness. So these instructions were actually with them in mind. They will turn you away from me to follow other gods. I'm warning you. I want to keep you. But what did Solomon do? What was the consequence of leaving that door open to temptation? To other masters. Follow the reading with me. In the book of 1 Kings. Chapter 11. Verses 1 to 4. I read in your hearing. But King Solomon loved many foreign women. As well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites. Ammonites. Edomites. Sidonians. And Hittites. From the nation of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his hearts. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father, David. It is incredible to hear the results of a life who is close to the Lord at one point who delights in the Lord. But throughout that journey, something happens. Another master begins to show his face. And this right here is a clear example of a king of God's people who left that door open and something came and took mastery over his life. There was a third thing that we find in the book of Deuteronomy as well, chapter 17. And now I want to read verse 16 and the second part of verse 17. I read this in your hearing. This is what scripture says. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to turn to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. 
The second part of verse 17 says this. Nor shall he, talking about kings, greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now, what happened in Solomon's life? I want to invite you to go to 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 to 28. And this is what happened with, with my man Solomon. I love Solomon. I love his journey. But this is what happens. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made, he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. Also, Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Keva. The king's merchants bought them in Keva at the current price. Once again, God gives a warning, but his heart is turned to that open door that leads to temptation and to disobedience. Solomon, the man who had asked and received divine wisdom, did not put it to use. He had the knowledge of what was required of him for his own good and the good of his people, but he didn't follow through with his actions. He tried to serve two masters at the same time. But look at what happens when a person attempts to manage two servants at the same time. This is what happens when human beings like you and me attempt to manage a split alliance. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we find that Solomon sought to build alliances with other kings. The reason why we read that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That was a way of making alliances with other kings. And here in 1 Kings chapter 3, we read that he made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and marries Pharaoh's daughter until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Now watch this. In 2 Chronicles 8:11, this is all the story of Solomon. Now Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to the house that he had built for her. For he said, my wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. This seems so contradictory when we read it. This is typical of those people who are trying to manage serving to masters. The essence of what is happening here is that instead of these people seeing sin as the problem, seeing this managing as the problem, they see the awkwardness that the situation creates as the problem and believe that if they can find a solution to get rid of that awkwardness, then everything is going to be okay. That is exactly what the enemy so much desires to do in every single human person. Remember, Scripture says of the enemy that he is a liar and the father of lies, making sin, making this managing of two masters seem like a good idea is one of his most effective weapons. When an individual chooses to manage their split alliance, they are choosing stress over peace. They are choosing oppression over freedom. And ultimately, they are choosing danger instead of safety. Why is it? And this is a question that I asked myself as I was preparing for this sermon. Why is it that so many people today 
attempt to manage a split alliance, manage having two masters. Why is it that so many humans, including myself, we try to manage having two masters over our lives? See, thousands of psychologists and philosophers have attempted to explain why people behave the way that they do. But this is something I love about Scripture. That Scripture cuts straight through all the ideas, through all the talk, and through all the hypotheses. And it gets right to the center of the matter. It hits the nail on the head. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, we read, Keep your heart with all diligence is the divine instruction. Keep it with all diligence. Guard it with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. There are other versions that say, for it determines the course of your life. The heart in, in the context of this verse, Proverbs 4.23, refers to, to the inner you. It refers to that place where your will your emotions and intellect come together to form that thing that you and I call my passion. My passion. The reason why this is so important is because every person on earth is ultimately led or driven by their passion. See, I, I have spoken to some people before mainly young people, that ask me the question, what is life going to bring me? And the reality is that when it comes to specific events, we can't really know what it is that life specifically is going to bring you. But one thing we can definitely know. And that is the general direction of your life. We can know what the general direction of my life is going to be. And why do I say that? Because plainly what scripture is saying here is that your heart, that place where your driving passions reside, shows what you will pursue. So if I'm not passionate about anything, then what do you think the general direction of your life is going to be? What should I expect from life if I'm, if I'm not passionate about anything? If I am passionate about music, what do you think that I am going to experience during my life? What kind of opportunities I'm going to get? What kind of things I'm going to pursue? It's going to be all surrounded with music because it's my passion. It's what I'm driven, right? So where, when a person has chosen to manage the sin of split alliance, that sin has become their dominant passion and that which they will pursue. See, that's why the Bible here warns us to guard our hearts because it determines the course of my life. Jesus knows this. He knows how important it is for us to keep our hearts. And that's why his desire is for you to willingly give him your heart. He wants to keep your heart. He wants to guard it. That's why he invites us in Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. That is God's desire for every single human person. The throne of my heart does not offer enough space for two or more passions. God is not a God that shares the throne of your heart with anything nor anyone. And that is what Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 is exactly referring to. 
No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot love God and Mammon. So here is where we begin to really understand what it means to manage this condition of a split alliance with the realization that whoever is doing this is coming from a heart that is not at peace with God. If you can identify with this condition, I would like to invite you today to heed the word of God and recognize that the best thing that all of us can do is to repent. The best thing that we can do is to repent and allow God to come and guard our hearts. I don't know about you, but as I was writing my sermon, I started to think about my own journey. And personally, I am tired of having a split alliance with other masters that seek to control me. I do not want any of us to live in this sinful condition that puts stress on us, holds us in bondage, and presents a threat to our holistic well-being as well as to our spiritual well-being and future. If this is your condition today, the invitation that has always been an invitation throughout the ages by God to humans is repent, come to me. So there is a question that I want to make sure that you who are listening to us this morning or this afternoon or, or this evening, that you will have clear in your mind. The question is, what is repentance? What is repentance? Some people define repentance as feeling sorry for sin. And even though this, there is an element of remorse involved in repentance, there is more about repentance than just feeling remorse. By definition, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in behavior. Let me repeat that once again for those who are listening. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in behavior. Now, the book Steps to Christ, one of my favorite books, states something about what encompasses that change of mind. This is what page 23 of Steps to Christ states, repentance includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in the heart, there will be no real change in the life. But I want you to know that this is Something that you cannot do for yourself. Sadly, there are people who think that God cannot accept me if I have not repented or if I am not currently walking in his ways. This is one of the most mistaken theologies that I have ever heard. And I will never say something like that because I personally, Jose Daniel Sanchez, I will be destroying the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, in the same book, Steps to Christ, page 25 and 26, we read about this reality that repentance such as this is beyond the reach of our own power to accomplish 
It is obtained only from Christ, who ascended up on high and has given gifts unto men. Just here is a point on which many may err, and hence they fall of receiving the help that Christ desires to give to them. They think that they cannot come to Christ unless they first repent. You're hearing well, that's correct. And that repentance prepares for the forgiveness of sins. It is true that repentance does precede the forgiveness of sins. For it is only the broken and contrite heart that will feel the need of a Savior. But, and here are two very important questions, but must the sinner wait till he has repented before he can come to Jesus? Is repentance to be made an obstacle between the sinner and the Savior? The Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. Repentance, therefore, is a response to grace that makes us different from what we were before. When I study the life of Jesus, Jesus personally came to a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene after she had been found in the act of adultery. He also approached that woman at the well, that woman who was currently living in a condition of seeking things that couldn't satisfy her. Jesus stopped under the shadow of that sycamore tree, looked up and said to Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, Zacchaeus, for today I must stay in your house. People who were inside that door of managing a split alliance, or people that maybe didn't have anything to do with Jesus and only following that other master. I do not know the exact details of the conversations that Jesus had with these individuals. One thing I know, and that is that that encounter with Jesus is what made the whole difference, and they left that conversation having repented and having given their hearts to the Savior, Jesus Christ. So repentance is a response to understanding and accepting the gospel of Jesus, which in essence says the following words, my faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for my sins and for humanity's sins is the source of my salvation. When you are able to understand and make the essence of the gospel your own, that makes the whole difference. It is not my faith plus my works save me. That's why Jesus said in Ephesians, and by Jesus I mean the inspiration of, of Scripture, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And then verse 9 says this, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So salvation is a reality when by faith through grace or by grace through faith, I receive the salvation that Jesus Christ gives to me. Now, when I live in that reality of salvation because of Jesus, then that reality inspires me to obey, not to be saved, but because I am saved in Jesus. This message is definitely liberating. It gives me freedom. 
And it is my desire, as we come to the end of this message, as we come to the end of the series, the greatest sermon ever preached, that you will never forget that Jesus Christ is all about humanity's happiness. And every single message that we have spoken about points to this reality. Jesus Christ desires to give you the happiness that you so much desire. And he wants to be the one that guards your heart. Because if he is caring, then that determination that guides your life will be led by him and not by yourself. So the invitation today, as we see in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, he or she who covers his or her sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Here is Jesus' invitation to you today as we finish our series. This is what he says to us. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. I hope that you enjoyed our series. And I pray that we will not only be hearers of God's word, but that we will also be doers and rest assured that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Will you give him that chance as well? I pray you do. We thank you so much for joining us in our YouTube page here at Candle with Seventh-day Adventist Church. Before you go, I would like to have a prayer of consecration for all of us. Let's pray. Dear God, I want to thank you for bringing us up to this point in this series. Thank you for inviting us to give you our hearts for you so much desire to keep it unguarded and because at the end of the day, your desire is to give us the happiness that so many of us are seeking for. I pray, Lord, that we will surrender the throne of our hearts, that we will allow you, Lord, to take down any master, any idol, anything, or anyone who is currently sitting in that place of honor, and that we will allow you to sit on that throne. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you because we can live with the assurance that one day soon and very soon, you're coming to take us home. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.